Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to the first seminar of our four-part series on clinical quality improvement. It's part of the research boot camp series by WVCTSI. And um, up on the screen, you'll see our four segments. I'm not sure how, you, how good you can see those in the back, but I want to draw your attention to the fourth, which is um, a seminar on publishing your work. But we will have a um, guest speaker who will be here to provide a focused workshop that afternoon on the 25th. This will be very valuable to you, whether you're at the early stages or in the midst of this work. Um, he can provide some hands-on training. He's an expert in clinical quality improvement publications. So please reserve that afternoon, if you would, and we'll, more details will follow. I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Today we will start with Dr. Michael Sweet, and he's the director for the Center for Quality Outcomes at West Virginia University Hospitals. He is a WVU School of Pharmacy grad. He did his um, residency in infectious diseases in, at UC Davis, and then he came back here in 2009 where he's, again, director of um, quality outcomes. And then we also have Dr. Greg Barreto. He is um, pediatrics. He's, whoops. Medical Director for Performance and Improvement in the Children's Hospital and Fellowship Director for Neonatal and Perinatal Medicine. So I will hand it over to Dr. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much. What we're really trying to accomplish today is to look at the real-world experience of quality clinical improvement. Um, the second, third, and fourth lectures in the series will give you the structure of how to implement it, what the design is, is it research, is it quality improvement, and how to publish the results. So that's, that's the real meat of it. But what we're trying to bring is what is the real-world implications of this, and what are some of the successful stories that we have with WVU Healthcare? So the three objectives for today are to describe the external and internal factors that trigger quality improvement projects, to discuss specific initiatives in the neonatal intensive care units, and discuss the quality initiative to, dis to reduce hospital-acquired Clostridium difficile infections. Gotcha. All right. So this is just a quick overview of the 2014 performance improvement uh, program for West Virginia University Healthcare. In this, we have four different pylons. We have the people pylon, we have quality and safety, we have service, and we have growth and efficiency. For today, what we're going to focus on, and I've blown it up here for us, is the quality and safety since we're really looking at clinical quality improvement. The other three pylons are equally important, but fall more under performance improvement instead of clinical quality improvement. Looking at these, you can see here that we have several different measurements that we have chosen as, a, as an institution to look at. And we'll go into the reasons why we selected these, because there are hundreds of different reasons that we could have picked other measurements, but these are the ones that we selected. So I just want to highlight uh, some of these. One is readmission rate. So when patients leave the hospital, if they come in back in within 30 days after our care with them, it's considered a readmission. Uh, Clostridium difficile rate. We'll actually get very detailed into this, but this is a um, disease that we're looking at reducing. Then we have preventative care to make sure that our patients have the right immunizations, the right screenings to make sure that we are preventing harm before it happens, um, follow-up appointments, and our mortality rate. So what drives quality, uh, clinical quality improvement at WVU Healthcare? Well, there's actually external factors and internal factors. Um, external factors that, allow, that really guide us to pick our projects are public reporting, and financial incentives. And these can be from the private payers, these are uh, the insurance companies, or from the Affordable Care Act and other government regulatory 
uh, programs. Internally, we look at our patient outcomes. So we look at our high risk populations, our very vulnerable populations, and make sure that we're giving them appropriate care. Uh, Dr. Barreto will talk more specifically about this with the neonatal intensive care unit. And then patient safety. What are the high risk medications that we give to our patients? What are some of the high risk procedures? What is the transition of care through all of this? So these are things that internally we're concerned about and externally we're concerned about also. So reporting, why are we so worried about this? The, uh, we actually have a lot of people watching us, kind of like Big Brother. We have the Joint Commission. That's the regulatory body that comes and makes sure that we're practicing to the standards that the government has set for us. We have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is the payment arm of the government to make sure that they pay for patients who have Medicare. Uh, the CDC, we have to report to them what kind of hospital acquired infections we have. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, University Health System Consortium. So what that is, that's actually a group that we willingly give our information to so we can compare ourselves to all the other academic medical centers uh, in the country and, other, and, and some other ones. So I have consumer reports here, which sounds kind of funny, but in the future, when patients go to go see what hospital they want to go to, either for elective surgeries or even for some acute admissions, they're going to see which hospital is best. It is getting to the point of like when you buy a car. When you buy a car, you know what car you're going to buy when you walk into the dealership. The price is negotiable, but you know which car pretty much that you want. Healthcare is going that way and it's being driven by public reporting and groups like this. In fact, when I, was pre when I first made this slide about a year ago, the cover of Consumer Reports was the business of healing hearts. So we didn't know this was going to be reported in there. We didn't know our data was being reviewed by Consumer Reports. And in fact, when we turned to the page, the state of West Virginia, our West Virginia University Heart Institute was actually in here. And it had two stars. And this is a scale of one, two, or three stars, so we were in the middle of the pack with this. But this is information that is leaving our doors, is publicly being reported, and public perception really affects um, you know, our ability to take care of our populations. I really want to only spend about four slides on the for Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare as it's normally called. These are three programs that really affect reimbursement into the hospital. West Virginia University Hospitals is a nonprofit organization that's not in the business of making money but taking care of our patients. And we take a lot of charity care and we take a lot of um, patients who can't afford the care, but we don't turn anybody away. In fact, when I'm asked what is the number one reason I'm proud to work for WVU Healthcare, it's you can get the best care in the state at any time. We don't turn anybody away. Uh, not a lot of states can say that. A lot of states have charity hospitals and normal hospitals. Technically, we're the charity hospital for the state. Um, but with that, we do have to stay open. And these, these, these acts that have been pushed through Congress really affect how we look at our quality improvement. The first one is the Value-Based Purchasing Act. And in fact, in 2015, the government will withhold from all the hospitals $1.1 billion. And this is about 1.5% withhold. And in fact, in 2017, it's going to go up to a 2% withhold. So you can see it's going to be much more than that. They collect all the money. And what they do is then they measure the hospitals. And then they redistribute the money. Well, how do they measure the hospitals? Well, on the left-hand side here is 13 clinical process of care measures. These are actually quality measures. And for 2014, half your score was based off this. And so if you got money back or not, so some people got more money back. Some people got less money back. It all depends how you perform with quality improvement. And so this sometimes directs what should we look at. And in fact, some, this has to be taken into consideration. 
Uh, one interesting thing here, 30% of the score is actually based on the perception of the patient. So not actually the care that we give, but how the patient feels about the care that we gave. There's a re-emissions reduction program. And if you remember our PI plan, this was the number one thing on there. And this is a re-emission to any hospital within 30 days. So if you're in our hospital and you leave and you go to any hospital, it's considered a 30-day re-emission. Right now, they're only looking at specific diseases, heart attacks, heart failure, pneumonia. They're adding a couple others. But this is a penalty-only program. And so there isn't redistrib redistribution of the funds. This is the government just recouping what they consider is lost money from inappropriate care. And in fact, it can be up to 3% for fiscal year 2015, where the other one was only up to 2%. So you can see how much this can really impact us. Um, the one thing about this, and this has been a quote that's been out several times, is hospitals serving the poorest patients were not only more likely to incur a penalty, but more likely to incur the maximum penalty. Nobody takes, especially in this state, nobody takes care of more of the poorest patients than we do. So this is something that not only do we have to work on, but we have to work on harder than most other hospitals to achieve the same results. Yes? Well, right now, the reason we're seeing a, a more um, increase of that is because the hospital and the institution have actually brought in more surgeons. So we have the capacity to do that. So for right, and um, the reason and it, it's, there is there is a correlation. There's more ads for that because there's more people fitting into that age range that need hips and knees as our baby boomers get older. As that happens, more and more money is getting funneled to that. And so the government looks and says, hey, where are we spending all our money? Well, hips and knees seem to be going up, so we're going to focus on that. And so that's the correlation between the two. For hospital-acquired uh, condition reduction program, this is, looking at thing, this is looking at infections that happen within the hospital during your care for the patient. And what I want to, want to look down to is the future measures, Clostridium difficile infection. So this is going to be measured and part of this program. This, once again, is only a penalty program. They, they line up all the hospitals after they've scored you. And if you're in the lower 25%, they withhold 1% of your payments. If you're in the upper 75%, you, you get to keep what you have. And so looking at these things, this is, we're talking millions and millions of dollars just for our hospital. Overall, it's billions of dollars for the government. And so these are some of the things that really guide us when we're looking at things that we want to look at. And so roughly, how do we measure quality improvement? Well, first, we have to select a project or select something that we want to focus on. And you can see from some of the stuff that I've already presented, that's how we make some of these selections. Um, unfortunately, we have to worry about the external factors, but we also worry about some of our internal factors that we talked about. Once we have that, then we look at our baseline data how are we doing? And then we look at our benchmarking. How are, we, how are we doing? Okay, we have that number. How are all the rest of the hospitals doing? Are we providing adequate care, superb care, or care that could be optimized? Once we review that, we do the gap analysis. Okay, if we do need an improvement, where are we um, lacking compared to best practices? We then put in an intervention, and then we measure that. Once we measure that, then we go back to this beginning, evaluation and benchmarking again. Um, for right now, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Barreto, and he's actually going to talk to us about some of these projects and their results. All right, so good afternoon. So I, I work in the NICU, and um, I, we've been doing quality improvement projects for probably the last four to five years. So. Where do we start? Where do we begin? And you know, the, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement have provided guides for us. I'll tell you how we ended up beginning. Um, yeah. 
He said, you have to have the will to improve. You have to have that every day. You say, I need to do better at this. There has to be some way to do better at something else. And um, that will could be coming from your own staff, from, from your own team, saying that we need to do better. Our will was forced upon us four or five years ago. We had um, a, we could even say epidemic, but we had several line infections. And we have one child, one baby, one after another, getting infected by a certain organism that actually forced us to say, we're in trouble. What, what's going on? So that's actually what triggered us starting a quality improvement project. You must have ideas that are alternative to the status quo. Um, you know, when I started here, so I came from Penn State from training, I started here. The youngest attending was my partner, Dr. Yosek, who's been here for, I think, eight years at that time. And whenever I would ask, so how come we can't do this? Oh, this is what we've been doing for 10 years. That was the WVU way. Um, when I was back at Penn State, there was the Penn State way. And, and what you have to have is be, be more open and actually think outside the box. What are other things you can do, alternatives to improve your care? And then when you have that will, you have an idea that this is something we need to do better, we also have to stop talking about it. Every day we find ourselves talking, we need to do better at this. These are things we could do. We chat about ideas, but we don't push through with it. And, and that's actually what's been happening to us. We watch our data every year, and our infection rate was high, and we just keep talking about it. Next year will be better. Next year it's going to change. Um, it, and it never does. Um, you know, the, the system we have is actually built to produce the same results we're going to get. So, we, so it's really the will, the ideas, and the execution. So the NICU, our NICU belongs to a network called the Vermont Oxford Network. So, so what is this network? It's actually a group of around 900 NICUs around the world. What we do is we share our data. We actually give all our data from infection rates to um, bad lung outcomes to everything to them. And what they do is they send that data back and tell us this is how you're doing compared to the rest of the world, how you're doing um, compared to this group of hospitals that are the same type of acuity that you have. So they send us back that data. Um, just an overview of where I work, just an idea of, of the NICU. These are the kids I take care of. Um, and unfortunately, if you look at that, those set of feet, sometimes they're big. They are big considered in some parts of our world. There are, we have babies that are tinier than that. We have one of the most probably most vulnerable populations in the hospital. They're at high risk. And we've always, for the last ye couple of years, we have always rested on the fact that they're tiny, their immune systems are weak, they will get an infection, they will get sick. And we've actually rested on that excuse. We can't make it better because they're very, very weak. And we tell the parents, the very words we tell our parents, your baby was not ready to be born. And everything we do causes harm to your baby. That's why we have complications. We just wait for the, 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 in, the first infection they get because we've accepted they will have an infection. So the first slide I will show you, and I'll go through this slide for you. Um, actually, the next one. But so, so when you look at our NICU, so our NICU is considered the highest level NICU in the state. And actually, if you were to compare it nationwide, we're probably one of the, we are actually one of the highest levels. Um, we are a level four NICU based on the new guidelines. And there's only a couple of things that we don't do that we would send to other institutions. We're a regional referral center. The entire region refers to us. Um, we have most, more experienced caregivers. Um, you know, half of our group has been doing this from 10 to 20 years. Um, I'm looking if there's any nurse practitioner on the group because you know, I joke, out, joke with them. Our nurse practitioners built our NICU from the start. Um, and some of them, I, have, I wasn't even in school yet, and they've been doing this. That's how experienced our caregivers there are. And we have state-of-the-art equipment. Every possible thing we need to take care of these babies, we actually have. So, but does this make us a good NICU? You, know, you see our website, you see hospital websites and saying, this is everything that we could do. We have all these and we're great. 
But so you want to ask yourself, so how are we doing? Are we doing great based on that information there that we have this number of neonatologists and we have all these equipment? Are we giving good care because we have those? And at the end, you actually want to ask if you ever had the baby or know someone who's having a baby that needs help from us, is this where you're going to send your baby to, to get, get take care of? So the next set of slides I'm going to show you are data in the NICU. And this is actually one of the things that changed, the culture changed. We're not afraid to show people our data because that's actually the first step to getting better is accepting that you do need to get better. So this was, two, and I'll walk you through this slide. So this is 2009 in our NICU. Now, what this is, is if you see this dark line, this black line, what it means is if, our, if that dot lies on that black line, the chances of that baby getting a complication, any of all these complications, are the same if they were admitted at another hospital that belonged to the Vermont Oxford Network. Anything below that line means their chances of getting a complication here is less than the rest of the network that we share our data. And anything above that line means it's an X mark, it's an X for us. And what it means is actually as you reach two, so if you're here around what, this is around 30%, that means there are, they, we have 30% higher complication rates for these babies in the NICU. So if I were to ask you again, if you saw this data, would you send someone you know to our NICU? Now, so in 2009 was actually, mid-2008, 2009 was when we started our QI initiatives, our formal quality improvement initiatives. That was one of the years where we stopped saying, let's just keep on watching the data next year, we'll see what it does. We actually did try to do something about it. Infection was one. A big chunk of this in the middle are actually infections, complications and infections. And if you look at our 2012 data, a lot of those X's actually went away. And there's actually some where, if you look at here, we're doing a whole lot better than the rest of the world. And there's still some that were equal, but if you see there's more dots below the line, there are still some we need to do better at and work at. And actually, the ones that were left there are the ones that we don't have a formal QI project yet. So if you look closer, so this is data. It's the same graph. That's the same dark line. And this is brain bleeds, intraventricular hemorrhage. So if you look at brain bleeds, we are consistently above. We're almost like, what, almost 100% more compared to the rest of the world. And around 2010, was actually Dr. Yosek led this. He actually led what we call our small baby program. How do we um, take care of our tiniest infants? Actually, our babies that are 1,500 grams and below. These are our one pound, two pound babies. How do we take good care of them to decrease brain bleeds? And this is our first set of data we saw. This is blindness. So, so this is the most common cause of blindness, ROP, for the premature babies. So, so far, at least for this one, we, if we even look back, we're doing okay. We're a little above the line. This is chronic lung disease. What this means is they need oxygen when they reach term, when they're older. They need to be on a ventilator. And if you look here, we were skimming there, but you see, we're 2011, 2012, we're above that line. This is actually the initiative we're start the, we started this year. We, we jumped into chronic lung disease is one of the most complicated complications of prematurity. So when we started our QI project, we said, no, nope, this is probably not a good place to start because this is going to be very difficult to, we need a, an entire structure of people familiar with QI to do this. So we started this this year. Um, and we're working with nine other NICUs actually in doing this, um, in working this QI project. Actually, it may, those nine other NICUs are coming over and we're hosting um, a quality, um, a quality on-site meeting for those other nine other NICUs that, to, to actually talk about this very topic and how to do better care. Pneumothorax, now for those that are not familiar with what it is, it's actually when the, it, it's when we injure the lung and the lung bursts a little, and it empties air inside the chest cavity, 
makes the lung collapse. And you see how high we are. So those are the two projects we've identified. But if we, don't look, if we did not look at our data, we wouldn't have been able to identify that this is the things that we need to work on. And I'll show you what happened to our infection rate. So Quans, coag negative staph. Coag negative staph is a bacteria that's present in all our skin. In the adult world, if you have Quans, it's a contaminant. In our world, these things can actually kill babies. They are very deadly to babies. And look, from 2002 to 2009, we're almost like 100% more than anyone. But look at where we are. And you see us fluctuate up and down. We saw a slight increase in 12 and 13. But we don't expect this to come back. And, and one of the things that we look at is, I think, you know, when, when you do these QIs, you learn how to do the process. But the biggest change was a change in culture. So, so there was one time I walked into the NICU, and we had this short spike of infection. I think it was sometime in 2010. So we had this small spike. And when I walked in, everyone was upset. And one of our nurse clinicians approached me and said, why are you so happy? Did you not see that we had this rash of infections the past few days? I said, yeah. Um, yeah, I did see that. Then why are you so happy? Because everyone was so upset. It was a culture change. It was different. It wasn't acceptable anymore. It wasn't a norm. It wasn't because they're premature. That's why they get an infection. We knew it was preventable. And we knew that when we had those... Like right now, just like 2012, 13, we had a slight increase. We knew we had to look at what we're doing because there's something we're doing differently why we're seeing that increase. So did we make a difference? Now, this is just one year. For those babies less than 1,500 grams, when we looked at 2012, be, be, between 2011 and 2012, comparing the two years, those babies total spent 1,000 fewer days in the NICU. They spent 500 days less central lines, because their central lines could last for three months for just one child. 500 central line days. And when we actually look at cost, now Vermont Oxford did this cal calculations for us. We sent them our data. We actually saved around 700 bags of TPN for the year. And that means, you know, um, complications from having TPN going through under the skin when, when you have infiltrates. Um, and we reduced even staff time. We said they said around four, 600 hours of staff time that we decreased because there's a lot of work that staff needs to do when they're using TPN. And if you look at our central line infections, we actually went almost two years. We used to have a central line almost every month. We went almost two years in 2011 without the central line infection in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit. So did we make a difference? I think we did. So, so, there's, so there's this guy. It's the same a lot of times. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. And I'll just move it. And Forbes actually listed what are the things that we learned from Batman. Um, and <laughs> this is what, so it's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. And when I think about that, let's go back to the start. What did we say? We were a highest level NICU. We're a regional referral center. We have experienced caregivers. We have state-of-the-art equipment. But at the end of the day, that doesn't mean a lot. If you look at our data, we're saving these babies. We're giving them a chance for a better life because we're decreasing their complications. We're, and I think we're doing good. And right now, everyone's thought is there's always a way to do things better. So the last uh, quality, clinical quality improvement project I want to talk about is Clostridium difficile. And this is actually an ongoing project at the uh, institution. Clostridium difficile, for um, some of us who don't know what that is, is an intestinal infection that you get when you have an overgrowth of this bacteria. And so why did we select this project? 
because this is preventable harm to the patient. If you come to the hospital and we give you antibiotics or expose you to this, we actually cause harm to the patient. 90% of the deaths due to Clostridium difficile occur in the geriatric population. Once again, one of our most vulnerable populations. So the ends of the spectrums from the NICU to our geriatric population. Uh, the patient, once diagnosed with this, must, stay, must be placed in contact isolation for the hospital stay. When you're put into contact isolation, it's been shown that you actually uh, get less visits from family, you get less um, care from the staff because there's a lot that goes into having to put your isolation gear on, walking into the room, walking back out. Um, it is publicly reported on www.medicare.gov. Anybody right now can log into the government website and see how we're doing with this. Um, there's, an, there's an increased cost with this with the hospital, and it is one of the um, hospital acquired conditions that will be part of the hospital acquired condition uh, reduction program. Yes. It can be acquired outside. Um, so I went to www.medicare.gov and decided to look at our results. And when you go to medicare.gov, you can compare yourself to any other hospitals. So I compared it to the two other hospitals that are closest to us. And that's Mon County General Hospital and Fairmont General Hospital. And this is how the government reporting looks on the website. As you can see, for West Virginia University Hospitals, we're, wet, we're worse than the U.S. national benchmark. Um, there's no other way to put it because they put it in layman's terms, and it's a pretty bold statement there. If you actually dig a little further into it, they actually show you how much worse you are than the others. So the bottom graph here is West Virginia as a state. And the line of one is how many expected infections that you would have that would be acquired in the hospital. So if you don't overlap that one, you're much higher. We are currently at this reporting time, 1.79. So that's actually almost twice as much as the same scale that we use for the Vermont Oxford network. So baseline data and benchmarking, well, we already have our baseline data and benchmarking with the data that we have from the government. And so what did this really translate into for our patients? In January 2013, the June 2013, the, the CDC said, we would expect you with your sick patients, with how, with how much Clostridium difficile is in the community, that you would have 51 infections. And so we looked at our data, and we actually had 95 infections at that time. So that correlates pretty much with the data that the government is reporting. So what we did was a review of our current process and our gap analysis the next step down. So we reviewed the best practices. The, the number one cause for C. diff is after you've been exposed to it is antimicrobial usage. And there's two different classes for this. There's fluoroquinolones. These are drugs like Cipro and Levaquin. And third generation cephalosporins. These are drugs like ceftriaxone and some of the other ones that we use. Um, we also looked at appropriate testing. And then infection control and environmental factors. Uh, hand washing, uh, protective gear, and are we wearing our isolation uh, equipment appropriately? And then proper cleaning of rooms. And we'll go specifically in, into each of these. So we had a committee, we have a committee in place called the Antimicrobial Subcommittee. And what they did is they looked at fluoroquinolone use. And in fact, they found that we had high usage in several different areas in our ICUs to treat certain diseases that it didn't necessarily need it to be used in. And so what did this committee do? So what they did is for urinary tract infections and intra-abdominal infections and even pneumonia due to healthcare causes, they came out with guidelines and said fluoroquinolone shouldn't be the first drug that we should use because of the collateral damage. So now we have data that these cause collateral damage maybe other antibiotics are more appropriate to treat these. Um, what they showed was they reduced fluoroquinolone use by implementing these factors by 24% from January through June of 2013 as compared to the second half of the year. Um, once they've tackled this, now they're currently working on the other classes of antibiotics. Appropriate testing. 
there are a high number of patients who are carriers and do not have active disease. In fact, up to 20% of the patients in the hospital can actually be colonized with Clostridium difficile. And in fact, 5 to 9% of healthcare workers are colonized with it too. So if we actually went and tested everybody, there would be a lot of people who tested positive even though they don't have active disease. And there's no way to extinguish between active infections and colonization except for symptomology. So you can't use the lab tests to differentiate between the two. And so you have to be very cautious of should we test these people if we don't think they actually have that as a disease. And the problem is the false positives, if it does come up positive because they're a carrier and actually don't have the active disease, what are the consequences? Well, you get unnecessary antibiotic treatment because we actually treat this with antibiotics. And it's been shown if you treat carriers with antibiotics, they're more likely to flip over to active disease. So we can actually cause this. Um, we put these patients in isolation. And we've already talked about some of the pitfalls with that. And misdiagnosis. If a patient has these symptoms and we say, oh, it's because of the Clostridium difficile or the C. diff, we might really be missing what's causing the um, infection in the first place. So what are some of the quality clinical interventions that we did? So we have an electronic medical record. And what it does is when you order for a Clostridium difficile test, it looks to see if you had a positive um, Clostridium difficile test in the last 14 days because it doesn't clear. So if you order it, the patient's going to be positive again and actually doesn't give us any new information. Um, if you've had a negative in the last seven days, it pops up and say, hey, you might consider looking for another source because we already know it's been negative. And then the third one, which is actually the biggest impact one, is if the patient had received a laxative in the last 48 days. Now, this sounds, this sounds kind of funny, but it simulates the same symptoms that you have if you have a Clostridium difficile infection. Um, and you might not look for another cause. And in fact, when we looked at patients who had reported hospital-acquired Clostridium difficile infections, because they're reported if they're carriers or active infections, because we can't delineate between the two, about half of them had laxatives within the last 48 hours. Um, so what was the results of this? Approximately 50% of the orders that these best practice alerts fire on either get removed immediately or with follow-up education. And so in fact, we test a lot less for it now in uh, the appropriate populations. So what are some of the other ones? Well, Clostridium difficile lives as spores, and they're, they're very hard to kill, but also stay on the inanimate objects for a long time. And so we have to look at the environmental factors. And what we did is we introduced a new cleaning process. And it's called the BioQuell system, which is a brand name. But it's a hydrogen peroxide vapor machine. And so basically we wheel the machine into a room, seal it off, and it sprays hydrogen peroxide vapor and basically kills the C. diff and everything else in the room. Um, so when the patients get discharged and we need to clean the room, we actually use that as another layer to try to prevent the this, this spread. So we're looking at it from a couple different angles. From one, decreasing the factors that can cause it. Two, by making sure we're testing the people appropriately. And three, making sure that we don't give it to the patients in the first place. Um, hand washing, and everybody knows about hand washing. We get trained in this in kindergarten and preschool. There's a really interesting statistic from our hospital. If you look at bloodstream infections in the hospital. We've actually, since the, in the last 10 years, have seen a decrease in infections. But there's one year that we had an anomaly of a big decrease. And so, in fact, in fact it went down the lowest it's ever been. And the next year went up and then continued on the same linear line. So it was a linear line except for one year that it was exceptional for bloodstream infections in the hospital. And that year was 2009. As we all remember, 2009 was the H1N1 epidemic, where everybody was washing their hands, being careful. And in fact, we saw an overall reduction in infections because the public, the healthcare workers, and everybody were being uh, very cautious. So what are the results of this? 
Like we said, we had 95 infections from January 2013 to June 2013. The second half of the year, we actually had 64 infections. So just by starting to implement these things, we had a 35% reduction. Looking at the first two months of this year, we've had 15 infections. And if you annualize that out to six months, that's actually 45, which puts us lower than the state average, lower than our, our neighbors, and in fact, um, a 50% reduction just from a year ago, if you extrapolate that out. So these quality improvement projects um, do help our patients. These are things that we were causing harm to the patients, inadvertently, but were. But once we had the data and really looked at it, we made a difference. Um, there are some other initiatives that we have going on in the hospital. Uh, these are just some of those. Uh, but. Um, We'll get to the summary here. So quality improvement projects are triggered by the external factors and the internal factors. And this is kind of what guides us to what we should be focusing on. Uh, the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit has conducted several quality improvement projects with very good results and um, have learned a lot of valuable lessons that uh, the rest of the hospital could really learn from. And the clinical quality improvement project to reduce hospital-acquired um, C. diff infections is one example that we have of many, but these are real world experiences and real world uh, events that affect our patients. So I'd like everybody to remember that when they go to the second, third, and fourth lecture, which is how do we design a project, why it's important. These are the real world cases that really affect our friends, neighbors, families, and, and our patients here. Um, with that, is there is there any questions for Dr. Bretto or myself with any of this information? Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.